Now we take you to the 92nd Street Y in New York City for a panel discussion on the best-selling book, Germs, Biological Weapons and America's Secret War. You'll hear from the three co-authors of the work, New York Times journalists Judith Miller, Stephen Engelberg, and William Broad, as well as Jerome Hauer, former director of New York's Office of Emergency Management. ABC News correspondent Robert Krolwich moderated this hour, 25-minute discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Deborah Nadell McGee. Let's have a big applause. Good evening. I am the director of the Charles Simon Center for Adult Life and Learning at the 92nd Street Y. As Gail said, Deborah Nadell McGee. And I'd like to welcome you to our season of Great Minds Don't Think Alike. All of us have been deeply shaken by the terrorist attacks of September 11th. In keeping with our mission of serving the community by offering a forum for ideas, we have added a number of lectures, panel discussions, and interviews relevant to our new world order. One of these events is a special edition of Roger Rosenblatt and Friends, A New York State of Mind, featuring Ed Koch, Alan Alda, Joel Gray, Jane Pauley, Nora Ephron, Vartan Gregorian, Frank McCourt, and other special guests. This event will benefit the 92nd Street Y September 11th Response Fund, which helps us to provide vitally important mental health, emotional support, housing assistance, and employment services, as well as scholarship assistance to children and adults impacted by the disaster. And if you would like to make a contribution to the 92nd Street Y September 11th Response Fund, please contact our development office. Thank you. Now tonight's program. Biological Weapons and America's Secret War has been sponsored by our good friends, Barnes & Noble. We wish to thank Barnes & Noble for their continued support of our lecture program. Our moderator this evening, Robert Krulwich, special correspondent with ABC News, appears regularly on Nightline and hosts the network's 1999 series, Brave New World. His work on the PBS TV series Frontline has won Robert Krulwich, Emmy, George Polk, and DuPont Awards for programs on subjects from campaign reform to the internet. Our esteemed panel consists of Judith Miller, senior writer at the New York Times, Stephen Engelberg, senior investigative foreign news editor for the New York Times, William Broad, senior science writer for the New York Times, and Jerome H. Hauer, who served as the first director of New York City's Office of Emergency Management, and he's got a very long resume, which you'll learn about throughout the evening. Following their discussion, you will be able to ask questions of our guests, and please write your questions on the cards that you did receive as you entered the hall, and then they will be collected by our ushers throughout the program. At the end of the evening, you will be able to purchase copies of the new book, Germs, Biological Weapons, and America's Secret War, on sale in the Hall of Mirrors, and the authors, Judith Miller, Stephen Engelberg, and William Broad, will be signing copies of the books in the art gallery right next door to this room. And ladies and gentlemen, now please join me in welcoming Mr. Robert Krolwich. Thank you. Well, I guess we've taken care of the introductions, just so you know who's who geographically. Uh, Judy, obviously, directly to my left. Jerry, to her left. Stephen, to his left. Bill, on the far end. So, uh, having just read Germ, which is uh, the book that the three guys wrote, three, two men and a lady wrote, uh, one of the themes, one of the principal themes of the book is captured in a, in a remark by a fellow named Matthew Messelson. He's a Harvard biologist. So Steve, let me ask you. He says, the best thing that a wealthy nation on Earth can do is to keep war expensive. What does he mean by that? 
Well, I mean, I think it's one of the sort of striking things that we found in, in doing this research. Uh, uh, Bill and myself are both have a sort of background in thinking about nuclear weapons. And if you want to make an atom bomb and you're a nation, uh, there's this enormous number of hoops that you have to jump through. Uh, you have to get the uranium. You have to create an industrial infrastructure. You have to get the science right. You have to do a lot of testing. Uh, you know, it's billions and billions of dollars to do what we did at Los Alamos uh, in 1945. To get a germ weapon is a far, far easier proposition. The costs are much lower. Uh, the real thing that you need is expertise, is knowing how to do it. Uh, now, that means that it's easily within the grasp of a far broader group of people than you might expect. And what Messelson was saying is, let's try to lock this thing up before we get to the point we're at today, which is that for $100,000, $200,000, $200, uh, and a bit of expertise, you can go out and make the most horrific uh, weapons imaginable. So, Jerry, are we now at the stage where something like waging serious warfare is now a game that a whole lot of new players can play? That essentially the entry cost of going to war has just come way down. Well, I think you have to look at the perspective. Um, getting biological weapons uh, to a weaponized state is not as easy as it sounds. Getting biological agents... Weaponized means so that you can do get, something getting bad in, with it. Getting into a high quality uh, uh, state where you've got concentrated anthrax, or uh, if we look at, at just take anthrax, uh, getting it into a weaponized state is not as easy as it sounds. Getting biological agents and getting them uh, to a point where you can use them is not that difficult. What about the power? Uh, when, we, we, when you close your eyes and imagine an atomic bomb going off, you see an explosion that covers a, a discrete but pretty vast piece of the, of the target. Compare, Bill, what dropping an atomic bomb on Manhattan and dropping something germ-like on or about Manhattan. What's the difference? Can they be equally powerful? Depending, <clears throat> depending on the germ, it can be more devastating than a, a nuclear weapon, uh, especially if you're thinking about something contagious that spreads you know, from person to person to person. Um, anthrax is, is nice in a way because it just sits there. If you get it, it doesn't go to the next person. Um, the, the strangest thing of all about germ weapons is that they're silent. You know, when a nuke goes off, there's this enormous concussive blast, whoa, like that, <laughs> that you know, radiates out and uh, devastates stuff within a discrete area. Uh, germs are silent. You know, when the agent goes out, it's, it rides on the wind. They can be quite fickle, and that's one of the drawbacks. And it's also one of the hopes, because they are difficult uh, to di disseminate correctly. And uh, well, germ, the germ weapon people that we got to know in the course of writing this book uh, describe some of the difficulties, for instance, of attacking large cities because of the micro-meteorology and the, the fickle winds around skyscrapers and that kind of stuff. It's, a, um, it's, it's difficult to pull off in the, in, the, in the outside area, but it's silent. You don't know. And you don't have, until people start pouring into the emergency room, or until we get to the state where we have good germ detectors that can tell you the day you've been hit, there's this terrible sense of unknowing. The book begins with a, a, an attack, I guess it's a, a biological attack. It, it takes place in a little town called Dallas, Oregon, Judy, and it features Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, a woman named Sheila, and another woman who goes by the nickname Nurse Mengala. In other words, it's just not an attractive group of people. Could, could you describe what happened there? Right. This was 1984. Hold the mic a little closer to you. 1984 in the Dalles, as I learned it was called. Well, the Dow, not the Dallas, Dallas, Dallas. Oregon. Uh, and it is a breathtakingly beautiful place. And that's why this Indian guru wanted to settle there. And he and his followers did, and they attracted about three or 4,000 people, which was a lot. And they all wore red, and they worked like crazy, and believed in free sex. And so, as you can imagine, they were controversial within the community. So they wanted to expand, and the locals didn't want them to expand. So they decided, in the best of American traditions, that they would get rid of the Wasco County planning board, they could expand, and they would do this by making everyone very sick so they couldn't vote. 
And this was actually the first biological weapons attack, a mass attack on the United States. They succeeded in making these people sick, about 750 people, by sprinkling salmonella in these salad bars and coffee uh, jars and uh, things of, of restaurants all the way along the highway. And uh, they just wanted to see if they could do it in advance of the election, and they did. And it took more than a year to discover that this was not a natural outbreak of salmonella, but that this was, in fact, an attack. Actually, it took the, the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh himself right. accusing his own folks to actually... Right, yeah. Sir God, as that's what Bhagwan Sri translates as. Sir God, uh, there was a fight within the cult, and basically the cult imploded, and he stood up at a news conference a year after the actual attack and accused some of his followers of getting carried away and making people sick. And that gave the FBI what they needed at that point to go into the Rajneesh Puram, as it was called, with search warrants. And they found the bacterial disks which had contained salmonella, and it was a perfect match with the salmonella that had made the people of Oregon sick the year before, and voila, the mystery was solved. But even after that, you would have thought that this was kind of a wake-up call for America, but it wasn't, because the health authorities, the CDC, that did the investigation, said, you know, this is really very easy to do, and we don't want to alarm people. So let's not write about it. Let's not do a thorough epidemiological study. Let's not publish it right now. In fact, it wasn't published until 1997. So what should have been a wake-up call uh, didn't wake anyone up at all. One of the more shocking parts of this is that the, the Sheila and Nurse Mengele, when they were looking for the salmonella, I didn't realize this, Steve, but you can, in those days anyway, you could just call up uh, any number of laboratories around the country, and they called up, uh, I guess, w VWR Scientific, which is a company in Seattle, and a company that gets very often mentioned in your book called the American Type Culture Collection. Well, it wasn't just in those days. It actually went on in 1984, as uh, Judy points out, they ordered salmonella. A few years later, uh, uh, some Iraqi front companies uh, ordered, uh, you know, a, a nice selection of anthrax. You know, just the same explain to where, where is this place? This, uh, well, it's, it, it's moved. I mean, uh, Virginia now or Maryland? I always forget. It's, it, it's, in, it's in Virginia now. They've it's moved in Virginia. Um, and you, it has a catalog? And you look and you say, I'd like a little botulism. Is it well, like a list? I mean, to, to, to be fair here, let, let's, let's be a little bit oh, fair. Why no, not? <laughs> the... It's very useful in science to be able to have a reference library of strains and to be able to order specific strains for research. This has a real purpose. Uh, th the issue is not, you know, oh my goodness, there are germ banks on Earth which researchers use. The issue is what kind of controls are out there uh, to prevent your true nutcases uh, from ordering whatever they want. And the, the, the reason, uh, you know, one of the main reasons we've succeeded in crushing infectious disease is because researchers have been exchanging these strains and getting them out of banks and studying how to get uh, a leg up on tuberculosis or <coughs> plague or whatever it is. It's, it's the main reason we live to an average age of, you know, whatever it is, 70 uh, or, you know, 80 years. Um, but a possible argument why we might be in danger of not being able to live to that natural length is the following story from your book. The CIA publishes a paper in 19... 88 and says, let's not send any more of these terrible germs to Iraq for X, Y, and Z reasons. Three months later, an order arrives from Iraq, from Baghdad, mm -hmm. at the American Type Culture Collection. It's filled on September 29th, 1988, mm -hmm. three months after the CIA warning. What? There, there were no controls in place for these types of shipment of, uh, of biological agents. I mean, anybody could... I think you have to have some kind of customs well, permission. If you remember Larry Wayne Harris, uh, who was uh, kind of a crackpot scientist that... Uh, he was a microbiologist that uh, was... Kind of a right-wing kind of guy. He was an extremist that, uh, back in the uh, mid-90s, was arrested for having various biological agents at home. Uh, Which he got from the same place. Yeah, he ordered yeah. them for, and, and it was really at that point in time that they began looking at putting controls in place, and the CDC was responsible for controlling the shipment of these things. 
enforcement is still difficult. It's weird to me that it takes an American right-wing uh, microbiologist to create the, enough of a problem. Here you've got Iraq ordering and ordering and ordering. The CIA says, don't, 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 and off go the orders. Well, well and, and Jerry, it, it, you have to admit, it's, it's passing strange. I mean, that particular document that he's mentioning not only says Iraq is ordering it, it says Iraq is ordering it from ATCC. Right. So you would have thought that perhaps one official or analyst or expert or bureaucrat in one agency could have picked up the phone and called somebody and said, you know, I know there's no rules on this, but maybe just on this one we don't have to do this. You know, you're in the federal government a bit these days. Why doesn't somebody do that? Well, I, I think that, uh, that there's an enormous disconnect in the federal <laughs> system. I mean, maybe that's an understatement. <laughs> but, uh, the enormous disconnect uh, being an understatement uh, is a little scary of a notion. <laughs> the, the agencies historically have not talked to each other, and they uh, particularly have not talked to each other about this issue. Uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of the agencies, a lot of agency heads did not see this as a, as a significant uh, problem um, uh, up until uh, uh, September 11th. Uh, we had trouble getting people engaged in this issue. And uh, it's, it, as Judy will tell you, we've, we've been down there testifying uh, for six or seven years trying to get uh, some attention uh, focused on just how serious uh, biological agents could be, uh, you know, the poor man's atom bomb. Um, and uh, we uh, really, up until 1998 when we briefed uh, President Clinton, and I, I've got to tell you, he was very engaged on the issue. Um, and uh, he really tried uh, everything uh, he could to, to get the federal agencies focused. Uh, we could not get Donna Shalala focused on this issue one bit. Uh, Janet Reno was very engaged. Uh, but we, the agencies did not talk. I think that uh, Tom Ridge's role uh, to try and get the agencies together, to get uh, the agencies focused, uh, is going to be a real challenge. I, th I think that uh, he now has the backing of the White House to get it done. But uh, memos like this could float around, and uh, the CIA might not have been talking to the FBI. The CIA has no domestic role. So in order to affect this kind of thing, they would have had to have talked to the FBI, who would have had to have talked to American tissue culture and said, maybe we don't want to ship this stuff to Iraq. The likelihood of that happening was pretty small. But I mean, ev ev eventually, by 89, they did produce they did. some export controls. So even though it was easy to get them in the United States, you couldn't ship them to Iraq without special waivers after that. So Once, however, Bill, once you, uh, you order these these raw stock materials. Um, is it easy to, I mean, I, what, what, what do you do you, to grow more of them? You get some from Virginia and you want to have many. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to go from some to many? Um, it, it doesn't take a whole lot, and especially if you're making a small quantity. Uh, you know, you can do this in a laboratory at any of the great universities uh, right around us. Um, well, actually, you guys in the book describe a, a sort of a Nevada experiment that went on. Where right. describe what happened, one of you, what happened there? Well, well Judy's actually yeah. seen it. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Judy's actually there. there. Yeah. I was there. Uh, this was a, one of the bio defense activities that uh, our government was doing and not telling anyone about. In fact, they also didn't tell the CIA they were doing it. This was the Pentagon that was uh, going to build an off-the-shelf biological weapons lab to see if they could do it from kind of off-the-shelf parts. And also... Off-the-shelf meaning whatever's around. Yeah, you know, hardware stores, we'll get a Home used Depot. fermenter. Home, Home Depot. Home Depot. Uh, they bought a used fermenter from Germany. Fermenters are used for lots of things, from making yogurt to beer. Uh, they're a standard item these days. And so, in the middle of the Nevada test site, which is also pretty weird, they decided they would just take a gymnate, what had been a kind of rec hall, very small room, actually about this size, the size of the stage, and they would assemble all these things, a team of uh, DITRA people, that's a Defense Threat Reduction Agency. And they wouldn't tell the CIA about it, and they would see if the CIA could detect these purchases. Well, the CIA didn't detect the purchases. The plant was assembled in less than a year. It cost less than a million dollars to put together, substantially less. And no one knew it was there or detected its activity, and it made perfect weapons-grade simulants for anthrax. 
in little vials. And in, in the Nova that you guys are going to be on coming up, there you are sitting in what looks like some kind of, I don't know, little ordinary just a house along the road. Right. There was nothing big, nothing special, nothing conspicuous, nothing no. obvious. No. And, and I, who have been to a lot of, new, of uh, biological facilities all over the former Soviet Union, would never have picked out this you know, corrugated, like, building. It was the place where the atomic weapons people used to come just before the test to kind of do their work, and then they'd fall back here. And, and there was nothing about this pale yellow building, kind of cheap 1950s construction, that would have told you, hey, you know, they're making biological simulants in this building. And it was frightening because it brought home to me how relatively easy it would be to do this without detection. And that was the point of the government's experiment. That's why it wanted to do it, and it succeeded astonishingly well. Okay, so we got easy to get, we got easy to grow. Before I get to easy to fabricate, which is something that Jerry's been warning me about, let me ask you about the Iraqi material. The Iraqis um, did, did some kind of biological research, and I guess grew something then we went to war against them. Is what they grew still around, as far as we know, or is it gone away? Well, we, we can clarify a couple of things about this and then walk to mystery, which is where you end up. Um, it's amazing how sort of expert the American people have become on the subject of anthrax. We used to think this was a very arcane thing. Uh, before the war, the Iraqis made a liquid anthrax, which they put into shells and tried to figure out how they could uh, you know, use an airplane to disperse it. They did some experiments with that. And uh, it was pretty nasty stuff, but it was liquid. Um, it was 2,200 <coughs> gallons of liquid. Uh, yeah, a great That's deal. like a swimming pool worth of anthrax. Yeah, oh, yes. And, and other stuff, too. They also made botulinum, which is a toxin, very, very uh, you know, nasty substance that will uh, definitely uh, kill you if you come into contact with it. Um, they did not, before the Gulf War, succeed, as far as we know, we don't know by any means everything, in making the kind of powdered anthrax we see in these letters. However, after the war, the United Nations comes in, they look around, they finally figure out that all this stuff is there in liquid form. Uh, the Iraqis say, oh, we've destroyed it. Well, where are the records? Well, trust us, we lost those two. And there's a lot of conversation back and forth about this, and not everybody is convinced that everything was destroyed. Uh, then on top of that, they went to a factory uh, and discovered that the Iraqis were making a uh, biopesticide, stuff you'd spray on your roses to kill, you know, caterpillars, which happens to be a close relative of anthrax. And uh, normally you make this stuff in a certain kind of size so that it floats the ground and lands on the plants, you know, let's say 100 microns. But these guys were making their biopesticide at about a 5 micron size, which we now all know is the size that you see in these letters. That, of course, is worthless for a biopesticide because it float away, go up in the air. And nobody ever quite figured out why they were, had a whole factory to make this 5 micron biopesticide. So the working assumption is, A, they may or may not have destroyed their liquid anthrax. B, uh, they could well have powdered anthrax. And C, they certainly know how to make it. So that's kind of where we are, as far as we know, which isn't necessarily complete. OK, well, moving on then. <laughs> so easy to get, easy to grow. Now, easy to fabricate. The anthrax that went to Senator Daschle, is it American? in some sense of its design or bill? It is an American strain, uh, a domestic strain of anthrax. I mean, when you get below the species level, you get uh, lots of differentiation. There's about 93 different strains of anthrax. The, the one in the Dashiell letter, and in all the letters, it turns out, is Ames, uh, which was isolated sometime in uh, Ames, Iowa, at the Iowa State University. In it's, there's a debate whether the 40s, 50s, 60s, we're not sure, but at some point... And you point can come upon an anthrax spore and look in and, and trace it back to one dead cow from Ames, Iowa? Or yes, yeah, they have uh, distinctive DNA signatures and it just screams, you know, th this is, you know, what it is. Um, also, uh, uh, an, an even more troubling aspect of the Dashiell powder was that it had uh, uh, silica in it to take away the electrostatic charge and to make it very fluffy and light and to rise into the air easily, so the easier to get into your lungs, which was a trademark of, the, we're told, of the, the U.S. weapons program. So on two scores, this, this has, uh, on those two issues, it, it smells American in some respects. Not now, only does it that, smell American, but you actually in the book describe the fellow 
who turn anthrax into a dry, flaky, kind of non-clumpy powder, right. whose name is Bill Patrick. And when he leaves Fort Detrick, mm -hmm. this is an amazing <laughs> little piece of business. His business card. Could you describe his business card? <laughs> um, well, boy, he, he, Bill Patrick, first, right before I get into this, okay. is, a, is a great, I think, a great American. And is, a, is, and is a serious scientist. But he also, like many of these people, um, have a uh, love black humor. And his card has the Grim Reaper you know, with the hood and the scythe and uh, germs coming down. And what's, what's the phrase? It says bio-warfare bio on the site. Yeah, bio and this dark figure is casting out the germs. germs. Yeah, yeah. This bio, is, bio <laughs> this is the, our American designer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he also makes home movies mm -hmm. and demonstrates in his home movies that he has designed an anthrax which, once it falls down on the ground, can be lightly lofted up again. Right, right. Um, you like this guy. <laughs> I'm not a <laughs> Buyer beware. Yeah, I think Bill Patrick is a good man who is, he, ha he has been working for uh, a long, long time, ever since he quit the Army in 86, to try to raise the federal government's consciousness on this issue. And he, he's been laboring in that field, as Jerry Hauer has been laboring, as Josh Letterberg, as a lot of great Americans. And they did a lot of good. The reason we have uh, some stockpiles of medicines today that we can draw on in an emergency is because these people helped make the government aware of what the issues were. Now, Bill Patrick, like a lot of these death and destruction scientists, ha have an undeniable um, black humor idiosyncrasies, and you can dismiss them as slightly crazy, and, so, and in some respects they are. Um, but they... But, but, but he gets his point across. Bill, Bill will go into a Senate hearing with a sprayer and show how easy... It's like it is. A, he, he comes like with a garden well, sprayer. Well, he's got his little suitcase of <laughs> tricks and... He's he, terrified. He, yeah, he is. <laughs> and he's got a bag of anthrax stimulant. And uh, he shows people, first of all, he shows them how easy it is to get into federal office buildings <laughs> with all this stuff. Or on uh, airplanes. Or on airplanes. Yeah. And um, he, uh, at many Senate hearings, has pulled out his sprayer and said, I've just killed you all. And he, oh, you he know, breaks the, the ice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the place gets very quiet after he... Well, let me he, ask you, since we know that it might be easy to get, it might be easy to multiply it, and so forth, let me... Do you need a Bill Patrick under your roof to take these kinds of germs and make them very, very, very dangerous? There, there's some argument about that, and I, I'm one of the folks that uh, believes that you can get to a certain point in making a biological agent um, deadly, but getting it to the point where you have the concentration of spores that we saw in the Daschle letter, which was uh, 10 to the 12th or so uh, per ml. I mean, it, it was very concentrated uh, material where you've got the electrostatic charge removed, where you've got preservatives, where you've got it uh, milled down to uh, uh, under a micron, so it gets into the lungs. Uh, I don't believe that you know the Ted Kaczynski kind of uh, homegrown um, uh, terrorist uh, would do that. I think they could get to a point, and I think they could make a deadly anthrax. But to get it to the level that we're seeing now, I just I'm not one of the people that subscribe to that. What about let's switch germs and and. Since we've just had the experience of watching 19 people die wittingly or no in those airplanes, if I could convince, if I were running some terrorist organization and could convince someone to become a smallpox carrier, then I wouldn't need Bill Patrick, I wouldn't need any fabricators, I could just walk him into this room and he could sit and sit here, right? I mean, so the entry level to doing something really disastrous could be very, very yeah, we, we've had a debate about that. Uh, D.A. Henderson, who is um, probably the world's leading expert on smallpox, uh, has, uh, again, there's a debate about whether that would work or not. Um, it, well, he it, might look a little ugly, because he well, has all but, these... It, by the time you get to the point with smallpox that you're contagious, you are very, very sick. Uh, when you get to the ninth or tenth day uh, following exposure and you are contagious, 
you are extremely sick. Uh, and whether or not you'd be able to walk around, uh, most people at that point are, are really bedridden. Could it happen? Absolutely. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and the, the notion of contaminating people overseas, putting them on a plane, sending them to a couple cities, and, um, you know, one case of smallpox in New York City is a public health nightmare. Uh, so if, if, if we had one person that had the strength to get out and ride the subways or, or go into a theater like this or... But wouldn't such a person be, if, if the president keeps asking us to be aware, if we all saw what it looks like to have smallpox, we would recognize such a person and presumably throw a towel on him? Uh, you could, yes and no. It, you know, it depends on, you know, makeup, covering, you know, in the winter, people wear scarves, and smallpox is, uh, is spread through droplets, uh, through coughing. Uh, and uh, it you, could be done. You wouldn't have to be a martyr. I mean, you, you know, all you need is a little atomizer and running around. And I mean, I'm not. I don't want to, you know, give anybody ideas. But uh, you know, you don't. You don't have to be infected and That's true. get it. Get it around that way. Contagious agent. There are many others. Uh, well, let me switch. Because it's getting too sad. Let's go to the uh, to second theme, which is actually a very interesting theme in the book, which suggests obliquely really that that the that the world may be at a very dangerous moment right now because of the nature of war and that offensive weapons should never get too far ahead of defensive weapons or everything gets very unstable so iron is introduced and bronze shields no longer work or gunpowder trumps armor or horses and cavalry trump infantry are we at a stage now where weapons are being created for which there are no defenses temporarily, and so we're all exposed? Anyone? Well, back up one step and look, look at the motivations. Uh, we have a kind of, at least for the moment, a one superpower world in which in the area of conventional weaponry, you could say the United States really has an almost, you know, overwhelming advantage so this gives an incentive I think on the other side to look for something else and one can I mean I, I think it'd be a fair statement right Bill one can create weapons right now against which there is no defense that is a possibility whether, whether it's been done or not no it's another. more than that it has been done the Soviet Union did right. it I mean the difference between the Soviet program and the American program was that the Soviets made weapons against which there was no defense so you know, whereas the United States never weaponized smallpox, the Soviet Union had a hundred metric tons of the stuff. No, and, let me ask, uh, that's a fascinating, in the book you do describe the United States and the President of the United States, President Nixon says, let's not, we're not going to make any more biological weapons, and everybody says, neither will we. Everybody signs these things. And the Russians go ahead, and Bill Patrick calls these the oldie moldies. The oldie moldies are plague, smallpox, Marburg, and anthrax. Why did the Russians make such gigantic volumes of these traditional germs? What, were they, what did they do that for? Well, I kept asking uh, former Soviet scientists that when I would visit these facilities, you know, why so much? Why these agents against which there is no vaccine and there is no antibiotic that works in many cases? And they would just look at me and say, well, because we thought you were doing it. And I said, but, well, you know, we signed the treaty. And they would say to me, well, so did we. <laughs> and, and I said, well, um, but why so much? I mean, when uh, Andy Weber and I, uh, someone I write about in the, in the book, uh, uh, visit Stepnogorsk, this is a plant which is... Uh, has the production building, which is well, Let me two stop you, because this is too good a story. This is too okay. good a story. Uh, Andy Weber, who's actually sitting amongst us tonight, is uh, an amazing character in this book. First of all, who is he? Well... Well, don't show him. He's too <laughs> modest to be shown. He's here, but who, who is he? Uh, he is a Pentagon official who works for a program called Cooperative Threat Reduction, which was a, a very inspired and effective program aimed at w finding the former Soviet scientists who used to work. Yeah, but even before that, who what? He was a Georgetown kid, a Georgetown University student. Yeah. Learned Russian, fluent yeah. Russian. Mm -hmm. Served in the Arab world and spoke Arabic. Was in Saudi Arabia during the Gulf War. 
uh, switched over uh, to learn Russian and learned Russian. Goes to Kazakhstan. Goes to Kazakhstan, served in the embassy there, used to go hunting with Kazakh officials. Now here's the thing, he's a foreign service officer, he's in Kazakhstan, all the other foreign service officers I guess are living in the foreign service officers building. Yes. And Andy goes and gets his own apartment, has a three-legged pit bull named Maggie, <laughs> and decides to go lunch with the boys, in this case with the Kazaki boys. Yes. And, this and one, is really one day he's what? hunting and some guy says, hey, Andy, you want to see Stepnogorsk? Yes. So he, what is Stepnogorsk? Stepnogorsk was one of the few uh, standby production plants, giant facilities, outside of, of Russia, the heartland. It was in Kazakhstan, and that made it unusual because normally the Russians wanted to keep this stuff inside. Had any American ever been to this place? Never. And Andy Weber talked his way in and went with a team of Americans and visited it and told me afterwards that I just had to see it because I wouldn't believe it. And I went there about two years after he did. When and Andy arrives, though, there's a guy named Grenady Levyoshkin. Yes. So Grenady Levyoshkin is the colonel. He's in charge of this place. This is a huge complex with gigantic fertilizing things and God knows what. Two football fields long, ten fermenters, each one of, one, just one of these ten could have held the entire Iraqi biowarfare program. So this is, and this is one of six facilities like this in the former Soviet Union. So this one facility probably makes enough germs to kill all human beings. Yes, if the order came, that's what would happen. In the meantime, it was just kind of testing and making uh, batches to see if they worked properly. And Andy somehow gets an invitation from the president of the country to go to this place. Andy is very persuasive. <laughs> is it the pit bull or Andy? <laughs> <laughs> I never knew. I, hadn't, I didn't have the pleasure of meeting the pit bull. So they were still talking about the pit bull <laughs> in Kazakhstan when I got there. <laughs> well, the three legs leaves, leaves <laughs> yes, a little right. chance for the imagination to wonder. Right. So Granavi Lepyoshkin meets Andy at the front mm -hmm. of this place and says, get out of here. Yes, it is not love at first sight. What are you doing in my city? <laughs> what are you here for? And he says, well, actually, I'm here at the invitation of the president and the defense minister. And Lepyoshkin is having none of this, doesn't believe it. And Andy has to make a call to the capital and get faxes. And, uh, and finally, will not leave. He just will not go away. And uh, he so gradually Andy sits. got in gets in, right. and by the end of the day, for some mysterious reason, Granadi has him home and starts with his serenading cocker spaniel and yes. starts to sing to him. Yes, Chase. It, I think it must have been a dog thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but Dr. Lepyoshkin had this fantastic singing dog, Chase, that would sing along to these Russian ballads. <laughs> and and I, this I saw myself, so I know it's true. And they kind of bonded, you know. Uh, Andy Weber was not judgmental. He understood what was at stake. And I think all of the people in this program who worked so hard to build these contacts and relationships uh, had to be, had to suspend judgment so that the, the main project now, the goal of this program, was to link up with these Russians and, and uh, other former Soviet scientists to find out where they are, what they were working on, what they're doing now, and whom they're doing it for. And that is what the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program is all about. And it does it so successfully that uh, the United States now has a pretty good idea of who is where and what they are working on, thanks to this open, above-board, non-covert program, which was underfunded and has been underfunded since its existence. It is an amazing program, and the people who do it, thank you, Andy, have done us all a tremendous service in no, keeping us safe. It is amazing. But because of Andy's... Uh, Andy and Granati's friendship and the dogs and all create a, 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 um, an intelligence bonanza. Yeah. So Bill, we now discover step by step that the man who ran this place, Ken Alebeck, defects to the United States. He starts talking about it. And it turns out that the Russians are not content just to make lots of germs. They're making new versions of germs using recombinant DNA technology. Who is Sergei Popov? 
Sergei <coughs> is one of the, the creative uh, recombinant uh, bi bioengineers uh, and scientists that did genetic engineering on bugs, on bad bugs to make them even worse. He worked at uh, places like Vector and Obolinsk and um, it's really a, a, a mind-boggling kind of pursuit that these guys were into, but he would take something uh, we talk about in the book having taken a relatively mild bug, uh, the, the bug that causes uh, Legionnaire's disease, Legionella. And, you know, with the wonders of biotechnology and genetic engineering, they were able to take some of the genes uh, from uh, the human body and put them into this bug and be able to have this bug trigger and affect what is uh, qu quick multiple sclerosis in, in people that would get infected with it so that you'd have this uh, a, a, an immune uh, response, the immune system would start to destroy itself. And they tested these little uh, bugs on, uh, I think it was guinea pigs and mice, and they were walking up the, up the ladder uh, getting ready to test them on primates uh, when the program fell apart. So um, what, what possible reason would you have to create or you know, enhance nightmares. bubonic plague or yeah. these things that they were working on? Why would they do that? The, um, I mean, I, I can't answer that question for myself in the case of like that kind of germ, a super uh, Legionella. But the, the, the one thing that m makes, if you can make sense out of this black art at all, the idea of creating bugs that can outwit cures you know, a, uh, an anthrax that uh, you can outwit an antibiotic or can get around a vaccine. Um, our government worries about this right now. The Pentagon is doing its own uh, bioengineering of uh, a Russian uh, designer anthrax to, to make sure that it can't outwit our anthrax vaccine. So there's serious, serious measure, countermeasures. Um, it's a little bit of a biological arms race where you start to envision, you know, step, counter step, move, counter move. Is this in some degree a reflection of the kinds of personalities that do this sort of work? You have, uh, Sergei today is in Virginia, mm -hmm. and he says to you that he still can't, even though he's now working the other side of the, of the mm -hmm. game, yep. he still can't stop imagining new designs. Yeah, he definitely, they are, there is this um, scientific fascination with the possible. And you even see it in, in the likes of Robert Oppenheimer, you know, uh, with the idea that's so technically sweet for the H-bomb that he just really wants to, you know, go with it and see, you know, whether it can be done. And you see, you see this a lot. Now, Sergei's a smart guy, and he's trying to what make... About the more, what about the, more the, uh, what about the ordinary <laughs> oh. human instinct? They, like, there's a character in the book named Lev, who was met in Siberia, I think, by you. Yeah. Who, do, who knows his germ lines from A to Z. Mm -hmm. And then someone says, you know, remember when the Americans were taken hostage in uh, Iran? Yes. For months, right. and it was a world crisis? Right, right. And right. this man didn't know anything except his germs. Right. Right, well, I, I think they, that's the way the Soviet Union wanted it. Uh, Lev Sandakchev, who was the head of, what a wonderfully named institution, Vector, right, <laughs> which, which uh, specialized in smallpox and viruses, turning them into weapons. And uh, Lev is out in the middle of Siberia. It is a long schlep, ladies and gentlemen, to get there, <laughs> I can assure you. And once again, Andy Weber was out uh, talking to uh, Lev. This time, Lev Sandachiev was making one of his first trips to, Vir to Virginia, to the United States. And they discussed... Uh, Andy was trying to explain to him why it was that the Americans were so sensitive about Iran, why we didn't want the Russians providing technology, dangerous technology, to Iran. And he would say, you know, Lev, when, when our people were taken hostage, or you, we all remember that, <laughs> he hadn't a clue. He had never been told. And this is a man who's very senior. In, was very senior in the Soviet you, you scientific structure. You say it's a Soviet structure. thing, but, you know, Bill Patrick, our own guy, mm -hmm. tells Bill, I guess, <laughs> that... Uh, Many of these people are, I mean, scientists by nature, I w uh, you know, this is going to be a, a, one of those wild generalizations, which are, are, is obviously wrong, but many of them tend to be apolitical. And there are, I mean, we know from 
history from, from Hitler. Hitler. Bill says to you, you know, we never connected this to people. He says, yep. Yep. we never connected yes. to people. Yep. Maybe that's bad. I'm looking at this. Maybe <laughs> that's bad. Right. It was uh, it was designed to be impersonal. I mean, they did everything in their power to just you know to produce the product, and they do it you know in with biological arms and chemicals and nukes. I mean, you name it. But and even if their own people were falling ill, as the, as the weapons uh, scientists themselves were sometimes infected, and still it, it didn't quite die. I, I don't think, with all respect, that it is ahistorical. I, I think we, we're sort of forgetting a context. A political. I, I think we're forgetting a context, which is that before 1989. Uh, a lot of people viewed the competition between East and West as, uh, you know, a very right. serious right. thing. When you, when, you, when you press these people, and we, right. we, we felt know. the same way as you do, wait a minute, you, yeah. you wanted to do what with your entire life right. and figure out how to kill people in billions? Right. What were they thinking? What were they thinking? Right. I think, but, sorry, go ahead. One, one, one well, has no, to get back to that. Bill was making these weapons, and if you talk with him, uh, Bill was making these in, in the 50s and, and 60s when we were in the middle of this yeah. arms race, and, and the threat of war was very real, and being the, the good American that Bill was, they were looking, Bill, Bill did disconnect it. He, you know, they'd go out to Dugway, and they would look for ways to make it finer, to aerosolize it better, to lay it down better. They looked at the meteorology to see what type of environment was best to, to use it in, and they had this all worked out, and they viewed it uh, much like any other weapon. Uh, it was a weapon system to them. Um, it, it was there to protect the country. It was there in response. And as horrific as these things are now, uh, back then they were viewed as part of the, the arsenal that this country had. And Bill, well, let me talk about it in reverse. Let's talk about the defenses, because people who made them had to, of course, imagine that they might be used against their country, so they have to sort of figure out how to defend against them, which gets back to this theme, do we have offensive weapons for which there is no defense? The one horse problem comes to mind. Before the Gulf War, Bill, we decided, uh-oh, maybe Saddam Hussein may come at us with anthrax, right. so we thought we'd better get some anthrax vaccines up. And then came the one horse problem. What is this? I'm going to defer to uh, Steve. Steve. This is his an expert uh, on, the the, horse. on the horse. First flight, his name was. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it's actually not an anthrax vaccine. I learned this. This is an antitoxin, which yeah. what, is actually a useful thing to have. You've been, you've, I'm sorry, you've gotten the disease, and you can give somebody a medicine which will, you know, stop the disease from killing you. Um, we clearly did not believe in the American military. The American military did not believe, notwithstanding these various reports about anthrax being shipped here, there, and everywhere, they did not believe this was going to happen to them. And so, uh, not only do we only have the one horse to well, make... Well, you should explain this. That, that is, the antidote to botulism, I guess, is you go to a horse... Is it botulism? Botulism, yes. Yeah. You go to a horse uh, which has been exposed to this disease, you get some blood from the horse, the horse has done something, I guess, that's good, then you take the blood from the horse, and then you go and make medicines against the top. That's right. So we had one horse. That's right. One horse. Right. There was a famous Pentagon briefing where a guy came into the, uh, the they call it the tank, uh, where the chiefs of the various military services gathered. He wanted to explain exactly what the situation was vis-a-vis -vis the Iraqi bio program. And he put a picture of the horse up on a giant easel and he said, ladies and gentlemen, that's the industrial base for our biological defense program. <laughs> a, a slight exaggeration, but he made his point. Um, they also didn't have the anthrax vaccine on hand. They, they had uh, enough to cover you know, well, they were starting to order enough to cover 100,000 soldiers. They'd send 500,000 to the Gulf, so you can figure out what the problem was. And they never resolved this. They haven't, in fact, resolved it to this day. Well, John, let me ask you, is, Jerry, is, is it right to say that we're now at a time in history where there will be weapons coming online available to various belligerents for which we can't really produce the anti, the, the cure or the vaccine quick enough? That is, there's going to be now a lag. They'll have stuff. We'll have to go to our horse and wait for the horse, you know, and so forth. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're accelerating the smallpox uh, uh, vaccine program uh, quite significantly. We, right now, we've only got 15.4 million doses of smallpox vaccine um, uh, stored in the United States. If, in fact, we needed it uh, today, we could dilute it at 5 to 1 and have roughly 70, 77 million doses. Uh, but um, that, that's clearly, you know, if we had multiple cities, 
that might or might not be enough. We just don't know. Um, there but that's, are, a, that's anthrax, which we've heard of. No, that's smallpox. Oh, smallpox, I'm sorry. What about one of, the, one of well, Bill's descriptions is a, uh, one of Popov's one was a medicine that would make you so joyous. Remember this one? The, 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 the joy, you would die of joy. That was one the, of the. They worked on a number of. The, the, <laughs> they worked on a, num, a number of uh, biomodulators. Uh, some that would cause depression, some that would cause low blood pressure. They worked on some things that just worked on various parts of the uh, the, uh, the the physiology of. of, of uh, well, how do you design a defense against something you haven't seen yet? Well, uh, it's very difficult. Very very difficult. But not impossible. I mean, we're, so, we're spent, you know, DARPA is spending a lot of money on innovative, you know, broad spectrum things, you know, non-specific immunity, and there are... There's as long as you're going after the immune system or something that is um, immuno-regulated, uh, uh, that's fine. When you're going some, after something that goes after, that is not bacterial or viral or a toxin, uh, where you go after the physiology of the organism, then what you have to do is basically treat symptoms um, and, you know... If you recognize them. If you recognize them. What about, that's the other problem, detection. In the, in the Gulf War, we didn't know how to detect even uh, diseases we had heard of. We've got now something, uh, this was the, the, it was an anthrax detector that didn't work too well, but now Lawrence Livermore has come up with a handheld one. Do these work? The, no. Do we, no? Not very well. the, the, there's a new one, uh, the, the Mayo Clinic is, is field testing one right now. Uh, there's been a host of um, uh, biological detectors that have out, been out there. Um, I've been getting calls for five or six years and it, you know, these snake oil salesmen are out there that want to sell you these detectors to put in the office building, air handling systems for people to do home tests and they, they actually it, it, Four years ago, DOD gave out these little things called smart tickets to all the cities in the country, to all the fire departments, and they just don't work. Uh, the false uh, positives were, there's one agent that uh, they alluded to, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a larvicide, and uh, if you grind this up and it gives you a false positive for anthrax, uh, you could also miss anthrax. Uh, smart tickets have now come out with a second generation that they say is better. CDC at this point is not recommending any of these. I think within the next uh, six months to a year, though, we will see some kind of an immunoassay that does detect anthrax either in the environment or in patients. Uh, it, it, it's going to be very important that we're able to detect um, in, in humans uh, exposure to anthrax very quickly. We just don't have that now. Let me run to, I was going to ask you a bunch of other things, but let me just, so I get questions, I'm going to run to the end. Let's talk a little bit about the, some, since hope seems to be running out the window here. <laughs> there is, um, there are some solutions. One of them is, been, uh, is to really look at the public health system as a whole. Um, Steve, the public health system right now, according to you guys, have, half of them have no email. 20% of them still have rotary phones. I'm not sure as of when. But um, isn't there some movement, sort of a broad and growing movement, to address as a defense matter, like we used to do with highways, to say that all these community hospitals and all of the ability of people, doctors everywhere, to talk to other doctors everywhere quickly is a first-line defense at this point? Well, it's amazing how things have changed after September 11th. I mean, you know, the whole sort of emphasis uh, in the area of health was cutbacks, reductions, uh, you know, mergers of hospitals and other profit-making hospitals. But yes, absolutely. And, and the arguments, I'd really like to turn this over to Jerry because he lives and breathes this, but I mean, the simple argument is that um, this is a no-brainer. You improve your public health system, and if you have an outbreak of normal disease, you're better off. And if you have an outbreak of abnormal disease, you're better off, right? I mean, this, this well, is so simple. Th th this, uh, the public health infrastructure in this country uh, has been deteriorating for 20, 25 years. Uh, public health, uh, particularly after uh, September 11th, is a national security issue now. But, uh, you know, we've been monitoring. I mean, you can do this very cheaply and very easily. We've been doing this in New York City for almost five years now, where uh, there are a series of, of health indicators that allow you to monitor the health of the community so you can... Uh, there, uh, there's a guy out at Sandy, Al Zelikoff, who's done uh, a wonderful job of developing a system 
that allows you to overlay all this data on a map so you can look for aberrant patterns of disease in the community. Which means what, you know who's coming through the door with what at the end of every day? Yeah, you can do it on an hour-to-hour -hour basis where you look at EM, EM emergency medical service calls, uh, 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 deaths, uh, uh, sick calls, um, you can look at... Uh, can you do it if you don't have a computer in any hospital? No. Um, can you do it if you don't have a... But, only have rotary but that's phones? that's part of what has to be rebuilt. And that's part of what um, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, is trying to get done. This is not going to happen overnight. We've got health departments that, around the country that are, have spent their whole life uh, working nine to five, you know, no emergency numbers at night, and not responsive to these types of things. It's going to take some time to rebuild the public health infrastructure, but we've got to do it. But it's also going to take some money. And here's, you know, it's one thing to talk about, yes, we understand, we've got it, you know, public health, that's the mantra now. It's another thing to put your money where your mouth is. And Jerry's too modest to say this, but part of the reason New York is in such good shape relative to most cities is that he and Marcy Layton and the health department and a few other really inspired, dedicated people worked night and day to push, push, push to get money for the city for these kinds of emergency services and for the public health department. But now, even after September 11th and even after anthrax, the administration's bill that has got that is working its way through Congress only provides for $130 million extra to rebuild this massive, dilapidated infrastructure. Now, that is not serious. That is rhetoric. That's not a serious commitment. Well, let me talk that about something that the administration would feel more comfortable about. They, the DARPA, which is the, this um, division of the Defense Department that does very out there research, has been looking around in the private sector. And one of you guys, one of the two of you, described um, a company, really interesting to me, called Maxigen. Um, what do they do? They, uh, they have this uh, astonishing technique. Uh, to be able to kind of do uh, artificial evolution at a molecular level and come up with very quick uh, responses, uh, it, you know, in a petri dish, you know, and selecting for uh, different kinds of anti antibiotic resistance or um, building in uh, different kinds of uh, b being able to come up very rapidly uh, to evolve new kinds of uh, de uh, cures for various bugs. Um, but there's one where the soap industry, has, the detergent industry for years have been trying to figure out how to right. quickly remove grass strain, right, stains. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, the laundry. Yeah, enzymes, these advanced proteins that they can uh, come up with real quick. They make, on, on the commercial side, a better tide. On the biological defense side, they can come up with a better antibiotic. And they, and oh, they can I, do it's them it's very It's a process quickly. you call DNA shuffling. What does that mean? You... Um, you, you, you break the DNA or you take DNA from like 20, 30, 40 different strains and you take them and you mix them together and just by rote you are able to uh, kind of do a, tri a very quick trial and error um, uh, testing to see what works and what doesn't. You don't need a master plan. You kind of do it in the lab and see what works and you do it very quickly and in large volume and you it's almost mir miraculous how fast you can come up with novel compounds that can have very powerful activity. Uh, so the happy thought that I was having as I was reading this part of the book was you're standing on 34th Street and in comes some new dread disease and you yes. watch six people turn blue and pink or whatever yeah, yeah. and while they're doing that, some sniffer goes and hands it off to this company right. and they do a quick gene shuffle and they come up instantly with yeah. a spray that will counteract the spray <laughs> that's getting on you. Now, slow that happy yeah. dream down to something a little more reasonable. Is that the general idea? That it's a fast response reshuffle? Way, way out there, yeah. I yeah, mean, I mean that, biological that, arms race. People, yeah. are, people are definitely talking about that as a, as a thought, yes, absolutely. But by, you know, we should also remember too that before we t walk too far down that road, that just as Jerry was saying with the oldie moldies, this stuff ain't easy. And really, I, I think that we, you know, we, we shouldn't worry too much about the far future because it, a lot of times you make these superbugs and you get them out in the environment and they die. I mean, they look perfectly reasonable in a petri dish, but you get them out in the jungle of all the bacteria that are out there on this floor and on our bodies and everywhere else, and they can't compete. Yeah, and there's all th that's an important issue because, you know, in, in Ken Allaback has talked about uh, how they 
uh, tried splicing uh, Ebola and, and uh, smallpox to make a more lethal weapon. And at the end of the day, um, most of the folks uh, that I deal with think that in fact it might attenuate it and not be quite as lethal. And uh, we, we do know that Ebola, when it gets in the envir environment, uh, uh, dies very quickly as, as do uh, some of the other viruses. So we've got to keep this balanced, we've got to keep it in perspective, because while some of this stuff has been weaponized, you know, once you release it into the environment, it is not, uh, it does not survive very well. Some of it does, you know, anthrax, the spores from anthrax can stay around forever. Uh, they get into the soil, they get into the building, and they'll be around uh, for 50 or 60 years. Uh, smallpox is a, a virus that is very resilient. It's, it, it does not deteriorate. Some of these others, though, and some of these outliers uh, do not survive well in, in the environment. But well, Jerry, I'll, I'll, the, the, the thing you wor that I worry about, like what about a flu? I mean, flu... Oh, know? absolutely. It's a very good point. I mean, that, you know, the flu pandemic of, of 1918 killed millions and millions of people in this country. Uh, is somebody taking something like the flu, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. But then you get up with this, the, confront the problem of dropping the file cabinet on your own foot. You know, if you let something like that loose, it's going to, you know, even Osama bin Laden has a mother and who he calls before the attack. And, you know, you have to be careful when you mess around with this stuff. But I'm going to conclude our formal portion of this by just reading the nicest statistic in your book from something called the Monterey Institute of International Studies, whoever they are. In the 285 incidents, since 1976 involving some form of germ warfare or germs, 44% of them caused no harm at all. It was no clear harm. 76% hurt only five people or less. And in some of these cases, like in Japan, they just kept trying and trying and trying and had to switch to chemicals before anything worked. So there's statistics, at least up to now, on our side. Now I can go to the questions. This question begins side one. Uh-oh. <laughs> I am an infection control nurse at a large university-affiliated hospital scrambling to prepare for covert, as in source unknown, organism unknown, and overt, known organism in need of... Um, how can I do surveillance of all PTSs, all points in clinics and in emergency rooms for bioterrorism, and still do all my other activities? Effectively, I'm doing homeland biowarfare defense. I need help daily inside the hospital. Shouldn't this be federally funded? Actually, there, there's a movement to try and get um, uh, funding for hospitals, and uh, this is Judy's point. Uh, that, that, uh, we need more money for hospitals because the infection control folks at the, at the hospitals, infection uh, control nurses, uh, the ID docs um, can't pick up all this work. Um, we, do, we, we need to automate the hospitals, that will make it easier for the con infection control folks. But there needs to be somebody at the hospital whose role it is, is to look uh, broadly at what's going on uh, with these issues and to be able to feed data into the, public, the local public health department. And it, again, it, it, we need money to do this and it's going to take some time. There's a fascinating conflict between the two trends of sort of worries about biodefense and where healthcare is going, because more and more hospitals are profit-making ventures. The great trend in American profit-making ventures is to cut your inventory. You don't want a lot of stuff hanging around that you paid for because that doesn't help you make a profit. Well, it's the exact opposite of what you want for biodefense, which is plenty of inventory in case something bad happens. Clearly, the federal government is going to have to step in and, uh, and make up for that. Well, here's a contrary notion for someone in the audience. If the United States public relations machinery can create, can manufacture consent, so modern thinkers say, couldn't the U.S. also manufacture a bioterrorist enemy? The suggestion here is that the messengers are panicking and that the message is perhaps not as, as scary as we here are making it. Unless uh, that's a misinterpretation. I'll read it again. If the U.S. PR machine can manufacture consent, can the U.S. also manufacture a bioterrorist enemy? So, uh, let me see if I can understand the question. Are we fabricating the threat? Is it, or, or are we blowing it out of proportion? Yeah. You know, that's, uh, that's one of the issues we've had to confront for the last five or six years. Um, I think that for those of us that are in this business, and uh, you know, the, certainly the four of us here that have worked on this, when you look at the facts, 
You look at where some of the Russian scientists have gone. You look at the fact that we don't know where all the stockpiles, when they left Russia, did they take some of the seed culture with them? Uh, are they manufacturing this stuff elsewhere? Can it fall into to other hands? You know, the, the, the probability um, has certainly grown. Prior to September 11th, the, the probability of the use of a biological weapon was pretty low. But the impact is so significant that it's something we simply cannot ignore. It's something like smallpox, um, if it were, and God forbid it was ever used, uh, would, would be a devastating type of a, an incident. So, you know, we have to balance how we run around trying to uh, get people's attention on this. But, uh, you know, I, the, yeah, there are some people that like getting on TV and talking about the sky falling. There's also a, a group that has been quietly just going about talking to Congress, briefing the president, briefing agency heads, and trying to get attention to this issue. Uh, in, in what I think has been a fairly responsible fashion. Although I noticed that even the President of the United States, this is President uh, Clinton in your book, gets quite exercised because he reads a very scary novel. And the very scary novel is in fact a sort of a plot in a way. I mean the guy who writes it, a guy named Preston, is, is put on to writing it by people who have an agenda. So there is a sense that you use alarm in order to get results. And here was the President of the United States being quite uh, effectively alarmed by a tall story. I think this debate has changed somewhat after right. the anthrax letters and after September 11th. I mean, uh, I was, I guess, of the three of us, always kind of chicken little. Uh, you know, I really did think the sky would fall one day because I had lived and worked in the Middle East and knew how hard some of these militant groups were trying to get their hands on any kind of weapon of mass destruction that they could use against the all-powerful great Satan. And I never for a moment doubted that if they succeeded in getting these weapons and buying themselves a, a former Soviet scientist, that they would use what they had. So uh, we used to have fierce debates about this, but I came at it very much uh, alarmed and persuaded that the weapons could and should be used. And that fear and concern that I had was reinforced by my trips to the uh, former Soviet facilities. They were terrified. I should but, also but, ask you, as long as you're sitting here, what was it like to uh, open up that letter when the talcum powder that you oh, didn't know was letter. talcum powder? <laughs> Letter. Well, uh, well, let's put it this way. It wasn't, wasn't a great day for me. Uh, the only happy news was the end of it. Uh, it just shows Wait a second. You, you got the letter. Right. The you letter. were on the phone to someone at uh, was, NBC or something? No, no, I was on the phone actually with, yes, I, I learned at the time that the powder was kind of sitting on me that someone called me from NBC saying, have you heard what's happened here? And I'm sitting there saying, I'll get back to you. <laughs> so, what did you uh, do, by the way? You got up from your chair and did you... I, I, I thought that the three of us, certainly the four of us, that we've been trained. We know what to do. And when it really happens, you forget a lot of that training very, very quickly, I can assure you, because I, I did the right thing. But uh, my colleague... What did you do? Well, I decided I would get the powder off of me. Uh, so I went to the ladies' room, which is fortunately right near my desk, and washed it off. And so wasn't it on your skirt? And your it was on my pants, and then I'd gotten kind of a, 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 you know, it had gone in my face and my clothes. It, it was all over. So, And it was around me, and that's where we made the mistake, because colleagues everywhere, people rushed to someone's assistance. Uh, and colleagues came to me saying, are you all right? Are you all right? And of course, that's the last thing they should have done. They should have stayed away from me, and I should have been kept away from them, because the closer they came to the powder near my desk, the more in danger they were. So we wound up with a situation in which 20 people were taking Cipro at the New York Times until we discovered that it, it wasn't, in fact, anthrax. It was just whatever it was. And know. since you were the sky of falling lady, you must have been really... <laughs> I did think it was anthrax. I never, she I really didn't think it was. She told me it was talcum powder. When she called me, she I said, called him. <laughs> she said, I don't think this is real. She, she was actually very calm. In the moment. Well, yeah. Well, and, well, and she said, I think it's talcum powder. You know, it's interesting, Jerry. When, I, when you roll the movie back to that moment, you look at the advice we were given and what we now know, it was all wrong. In point of fact, one of the things people said to us was, 
Senator Judy, is it white? You suggest it's white, and they said, well, if it's white and dusty, it's certainly not going to be. And we now know from the Daschle letter it certainly That's could be. Absolutely right. And, you know, when it was described as having roughly fallen to the floor, the New York Health Department said, well, if it fell to the floor, I guess you, we can all just walk around this building. And again, had the Daschle letter come to us, uh, the outcome would have been very, very, absolutely. very unfortunate. Um, I'd like to come back to this uh, uh, question about the exaggeration, because I think it's very important, and it's, it's something that happened among us as authors. It, it, I was probably the most skeptical going into this, and really, professionally, all of us are trained skeptics by virtue of the journalism that we do, but we also had a lot of experience with the military and with threat inflation. I mean, the Pentagon mastered the art of building up the commie giant, right, to build its budgets and do all that stuff. And we walked, you know, n knowing all this and knowing that history, we walked into this at deeper and deeper and got more and more concerned as you look at the evidence and the unanswered questions and not knowing where those good, hardworking Soviet scientists are, some of whom are like Sergei Popov, certainly. Uh, at that point, we got seriously concerned and wrote this book. I mean, in fairness, though, I will say, if the letters had not been sent, uh, you know, we may well not be sitting here first of all, because no one would have ever read the book. But <laughs> <laughs> assuming that that was a case that people had read it and bought it for some reason, I think that there would have been a substantial group of people who would have said, and they would have had an argument, that this book is alarmist. Yeah. That in point of fact, not since the Rajneesh has, any, has anything happened, that you're off on the wrong track here. Terrorists do conventional right. kinds the of things. They do b truck bombs, car yeah. bombs. The airplane air bomb really is a variation on a theme that we've seen. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, you guys are deflecting us from doing what we should be doing, which is defending against conventional terrorism. All those arguments, I think, would have had some merit. And we can't, at least I can't, maybe Judy has a crystal ball. We, we can't pretend to be able to say we predicted the future. We just sort of took the trend lines and drew them out and toward the horizon and said at some point these things are going to cross. Well, here's a variation on the question. Is there any sense of what countries and individuals who might use these weapons consider their effect on third world countries when it spreads? It does raise the question, why didn't Saddam Hussein use some of the liquid stuff that he had? Or well, he did. He did. He used uh, both chemical weapons and uh, biologics in Halapcha. Um, he killed. He did? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, you know, not on us. On uh, no, not on Americans. No, on his but own he people. used yes. it on his own people, and he, uh, you know, there is a history there of using it. So, but this is a, an important issue, I think, when you look at something highly contagious like smallpox, because if it got loose, uh, you know, you have a possibility of a global epidemic that would hurt the developing world more than it would hurt us, where we do have medical care and can vaccinate quickly and try to cordon this thing off. But, uh, you know, there's a, there is a strong, uh, you know, built-in disincentive to, to let something absolutely wildly contagious like that loose. Well, here's the, the, the end to that, Yang. How likely is it that we would use biological or chemical weapons against, against Osama bin Laden or against the Taliban? I don't think there's no. any mm. chance that we would. First of all, we don't have stockpiles of you know, biological weapons anymore. We do have chemical weapons stockpiled in eight locations in the United States, and those are all targeted for destruction in one way or another. They're, uh, by, by and large, most of what's left are uh, organophosphates. Uh, and, uh, Is this never or not now? I don't think we would ever. Uh, first of all, the Wait a second. Have a treaty. in the book we describes the United States of America in 1962 with Mr. Bill Patrick reporting. Uh, saying that the United States was, was seriously considering, I don't know how seriously, poisoning the people of Cuba so that when we, uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, that we could um, neutralize them for a, for a period of weeks. And he said only 2% of them would die. Old folks like me, said Bill. If you do the math, 2% of Cuba would be about 140,000 dead people. Now, I don't know whether that was U.S. policy, but it apparently had come onto the table at some point in our own nation. We were going to use Q fever and tularemia, a mixture. They, were good, they had a cocktail ready of Q and tularemia to use in, in Cuba. I think in the current environment, first of all, we don't have the biological weapons anymore. We do have some chemical weapons, but most of them are not in condition that could be used. The and again, you guys answer this, but from my perspective, the likelihood 
of us ever using a chemical weapon in an offensive fashion um, it, 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 it almost non-existent. I, I, I mean, th th this all comes up, by the way, at a moment when, first of all, it's before these weapons have been banned, everybody's doing it, and I do not myself personally believe that we would have, that anybody sort of seriously at the top of the Kennedy administration was about to, you know, drop tularemia on Cuba. I, I don't know, Judy, do you, do you have a... No, we have no evidence that they, you know, it, it, the, these were boys with toys to uh, a large extent out there cooking up wild stuff. Well, it, it was a serious war plan. I mean, it oh, got to a fairly plan, right. serious, uh, high, sufficiently high level that we thought it important enough to put in our book. Mm -hmm. And the fact that that program and that plan is still secret to this day, uh, I think raises some questions. But for me, the dividing line was really uh, that great peacenik, Richard Nixon, who drew the line, paradox of paradoxes, and said, after 1969, no, the United States renounces this weapon, this whole class of weapons. We will not use these. We will abandon them. And that is something that the United States has stuck to. And uh, as far as I know, no one has ever alleged seriously with any credibility that we are engaged in offensive, uh, this kind of offensive work. And, and it goes back to your original opening observation. It's not really in our interest. I mean, right. these do weapons right. don't work well for military ops. They don't work well on a battlefield. They're perfect terrorist weapons. Yeah. Uh, here's my uh, second to last question, I guess, from the audience. Early in the course of the current terrorist activities, cases of anthrax infection were misdiagnosed. So therefore, it seems possible that anthrax deaths in the past were never diagnosed as such. Question. Is it at all likely that some of the recent anthrax deaths, uh, deaths are the result of contamination from normal activities and not from terrorist strikes? I don't think so, uh, unless you're out there sniffing the dirt, uh, <laughs> because there is some anthrax uh, that, that livestock that anim animals get, but uh, the cases of anthrax in this country are really few and far and in between, and I, d I don't think especially at this point when people have been on alert that uh, cases have been misdiagnosed, but somebody may well, have I, another view. Well, I think the view. fact that so many postal workers in these particular places where particular letters went have been afflicted tells you a fair amount. Uh, this is not a coincidence. Um, who has the technology to um, mill anthrax bacilli to improve aerosoling? And what is the current state of recombinant DNA research to combine viruses and improve delivery and speed? Well, we've talked about B, but who does have the, te the technology? Unfortunately, it's, it's widely, widely available. I, it's my impression. We've been doing web searches, and it's, um, th this, these powders, fine powders, are used everywhere in our economy. I mean, you have them in, um, uh, uh, when you make a floppy disk, and you want to be able to put down a fine a spray of magnetic particles. When you make, uh, when you have a laser printer going back and forth, and you need finally uh, a fine mist of all that kind of stuff. I mean, in pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, you're constantly milling fine powders down to the five micron size. Well, I'll give you a perfect example. My, uh, one, of my, not, one of my children has asthma, and there's a wonderful new invention. Instead of having to use a sort of little device to spray stuff for 10 minutes, it's just a little powder that you inhale, and it's a respirable level, uh, you know, obviously five micron things. And this is being made by a pharmaceutical company. It works very nicely. A little well, puff. Let me conclude by asking you um, to... to to try to look on the bright side of this if there is one. If, if the two central tenets of the book seem very dangerous to me, one is that we are at a very, very dangerous time because new weapons are arriving for which, which we cannot detect, cannot anticipate, and cannot defend against temporarily, I'm hoping. And B, there are many, many more players in the game of big time warfare because of these technologies. Then. How long a period of time are we so, ex is the, what, what clo what, when will this end? What has to happen? And arguably this just could go on and on and on. Well, I don't think it ends, but I, you know, when people say, well, gee, how do you sleep at night? How do you guys sleep at night? I think the answer to the question is, this is not like nuclear weapons. This is, biodefense is possible, and it's a question of money and will and commitment. Unlike nuclear weapons where we all remember, or some of us in this audience, duck and cover, which was pointless and ridiculous. 
There are so many things you can do in this area if a society has the will, from training your doctors and nurses and pharmacists to recognize these diseases when they see them, to getting internet in every public health office, to funding the kind of work that um, Steve and, and Jerry and, and Bill have been talking about. I mean, we can do something, which is really why I wanted to write this book. The, the other thing is that this, I think we're, it's a wonderful moment in time because um, to really, I mean, we've witnessed weapons of mass uh, pandemonium or disruption, not mass destruction. And really using this stuff, it, developing it in quantity and being able to produce mass death uh, is not easy to do. You know, you can't, the crop dusting with anthrax is not easy. And attacking a large city with a crop duster is not easy. There's many, many, many technical steps. And in a way, um, I, this is a beautiful moment because, if I can use this metaphor, we've kind of gotten uh, an immunization with these attacks. And, you know, the U.S. immune system is getting stronger now. And it can understand, you know, work better against the things that, are that are, could arise in the future because people are getting smarter. The information is getting out. The technology keeps marching forward. But it's hard to do, and that's, that gives us some time. I, I agree. I, I think this was a wake-up call, and I think that this is a time that we really need to, uh, to engage people in, in this issue. And as Judy said, it, it's going to take a, a financial commitment. Uh, there, we've got to get uh, the good science out there, and, and it's, it's all doable. This, the, this can all be addressed. The, the risk is, is not that great. Uh, but the impact is so significant that we can't ignore it. I've said that already. Uh, we really have to make the commitment, uh, and this hopefully uh, is the wake-up call that, that gets the Congress focused on this. And uh, I know the Secretary of Health has been very engaged in this uh, and, and since he took over and has been trying to refocus uh, effort. But, but it's going to take a financial commitment as well. Well, I'll just say in concluding that one of the things that the book taught me is that every so often you find in the midst of a very, very dark situation, you find somebody who sort of lights the way. This fellow, Andy Weber, who is here, did over and over again in these very weird circumstances address our traditional enemies, the Russians, the people who were actually in the process of building um, weapons to destroy us in very ugly ways, and something in his heart allowed him to sit down with these apparently very bad people and address them human to human and they responded in the most amazingly human way. So if you read the book or if you just breathe in deep because Andy's in the room so what he's exhaling you can inhale. <laughs> it is a, um, a brilliant silver lining to a very dark cloud so you know who you are and thank you very much and thank you all for coming. New York Times reporters Judith Miller, Stephen Engelberg, and William Broad are the co-authors of Germs, Biological Weapons, and America's Secret War, which is number four on this week's New York Times nonfiction bestsellers list. It's published by Simon & Schuster. If you'd like more information, visit them on the web at simonsays.com.